Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning and nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way. Writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you. I'm pleased to join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their work and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed our last episode with Bill Noricio and Roger Rosenblatt, you can go to Bird's Books Write America page and link to the episode easily. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch on our Write America YouTube channel, which has a link right on the front page. We are now hosting all of our episodes on Zoom, so all the recordings will reside on YouTube. Many of the earlier episodes are there already, and we will place this one there while I continue to move the early, earlier ones over. We had a change in lineup for this evening, and Adam Gopnik and Henry Louis Gates ended up with conflicts in their schedules. But tonight, we are hosting readings by in conversation with Jillian LaRussa and Claudia Acevedo Quinones. As part of the mission of Write America, we feel very strongly about giving a voice to new and emerging writers, and I know you will join me in welcoming these exceptional writers to our episode this evening. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. During the episode, please feel free to make comments or ask questions in the chat, but we do ask that you remain muted. Our first speaker is Jillian LaRussa. Jillian LaRussa is a writer, educator, and, and artist based in central New York. She received her MFA in creative writing and literature from Stony Brook University and currently serves as a career advisor at Colgate University. Her work has appeared in the Breakwater Review and Coffin Bell Journal. She refuses to walk if she can roller skate instead and falls in love with every abandoned building she's seen. Please welcome to the screen, Jillian LaRosa. Let me find you here, Jillian. Hi everyone. So today I'm going to be reading a chapter from the book I am still working on. The selection I'm going with is a chapter where my main character Laura is working at a spice shop and her new co-worker crush comes in and surprises her in the middle of an interaction with customer. So without further ado and without me qualifying it some more, uh, let me get into it. You know what? Give me three ounces of that. Ground. Ground, I repeated, my voice no longer infused with the saccharine drip I typically deployed with customers, or rather, the pretense of it. Listen, come in two minutes before close, shop around like the world begged for your sweaty, flip spot feet to pound over it, and ask me to blast some of the hottest dried peppers we owned with an overworked coffee grinder. Any attitude I gave became fully deserved. Linda, my usual Thursday partner in crime, would have asked if the guy was cooking something as good as he looked, or hell, willing to bring her in a taste. I stepped around his rotund stomach and lifted the container off the shelf. Fan of spicy, huh? I offered an, a lame attempt at my own charm bomb. Oh yeah, the hotter the better. Got some wings I'm gonna blast this weekend in the old smoker. Then I'm thinking, cookout, boys, brews, and chicken like the devil intended. Tearing out the scale with a small metal bowl atop it, I scooped three spoonfuls and then paused. Only a little over an ounce. Three more and I was just close enough. I threw in another for good measure and the bell above the door dinged. Fuck, couldn't lock up and help barbecue at the same time. I should have never told Linda to head home early. A slow day didn't always equal a dead night. Though we only stayed open barely past 6.30, we still drew in the diner crowd of tourists wandering through their wait times. You know what brews go great with these? 
I walked into the open back room and the guy circled closer to remain in talking distance. What? I took a shot. Japanese. It was a calculated risk, but a risk at that. I had only ever had Japanese beer with chichimi, a spicy peppery blend that I would shake loose into udon soup. I swiped a small bottle once and brought it to Walt and soon enough he had me mixing it by the next shift. Now that's thinking big kid and he clapped me on the back. I had dropped my spoon into the blend three times and felt the lingering effects of ground ginger coating my face for the rest of the day. Yeah, like real light stuff. Barbecue scrunched his face into thought and from my angle, he resembled a cartoon bear, considering something both equally serious and also possibly ridiculous. Well, kind of, you know, I shook the dried peppers that looked more like slim red beetles into the coffee grinder, popped on the top and pressed down. Shaking the machine, I ground spicy dust particles into the air. Mm, on the crisper side, delicate, nothing deep or strong. It'll tamper the heat, but also bring out complexities in flavor. Regardless, it's gonna be good, trust me. I set down the grinder and opened a plastic baggie. Shaking the ground pepper inside, I poured the rest into the machine for round two. I didn't think of that, good looks. He pulled out his phone and thumbed a message, maybe telling his buddies to ditch the IPAs. I nodded and sealed the bag. Scanning the wall, I found the container with the surplus bird's eye peppers and pulled out a label from the small patch attached to the front. I'm gonna convince you to try one more thing, but hear me out, okay? Together we walked to the front of the store and I caught a glimpse of the rogue customer that snuck in. Blue flip-flops and painted toes. Yellow, the color of banana meat. Be with you a minute. Feel free to open lids, sniff around, I called blindly and plucked another baggie of spices off the wall. The best part about the shop wasn't the stellar service courtesy of, well, Linda, but that anyone could come in, pull a container off the shelf and smell what was inside. Send guided my cooking long before I started, and it certainly helped well making my way around the shop to sneak a taste of everything. Best ever dip, barbecue asked, turning the blend around to read the ingredients in the back label. It's no joke, I said, punching in the code for ground pepper on the dated register. Cheddar and Parmesan cheese powder, beer powder, onion, garlic, chive, all that good stuff. Mix it with some cream cheese and the boys are gonna flip. I couldn't help myself. I loved the part of the job that was me, forcing my opinion on unsuspecting customers. The mixing, blending, grinding, and even drying were all fun, but showing people the possibility of something new, something delicious, kept me excited about coming in. All I had to do was ask a little, find out what people liked, what they relied on, and I could usually nail down the one thing that would bring them out of their shell. I convinced old ladies intent on chai tea to go for herbal floral brews. I introduced grill worshipers to smoky salts. It was as if I could see what they needed before they knew it too. I used to think Walt promoted me to get out of standing on his feet and breathing in pepper dust. With every interaction, it felt more and more like he saw this in me the same as I did. Excellent, check it in. I obliged and popped the baggies into a brown paper bag with the stamp of our logo on the front. The shop's logo, actually. Working here for over two years lulled me into a good state of what I could only conclude was safety. When my house felt too overwhelmingly empty, this place was always somewhere that would take me in. And that became the closest enough conclusion to home that I could ever draw, at least after, after Jesse. What's your name, he asked, and picked up a business card to add in with the spices. It's, and then I finally got a glimpse of the customer that walked in technically after close. Long legs, curly hair, and a side grin I couldn't help but return, almost on instinct. I wondered how she found me. Yes, technically I was just down the block and her shift probably ended, but I couldn't help but let my mind wander. She catches a glimpse of the light brown end of my ponytail, the pockets on my jeans. She knows who's behind that counter. She reads the sign and thinks, yeah, worth a chance. I might as well come in. I always rooted for the longest of shots. Laura. At the sound of my name, she looked up and straight at me. There was a laugh hidden on the curl of her lips, buried in the heat of her brown eyes. Something else was there too. It seemed like I was the X marking the spot on her treasure map because they portrayed the release of, there you are, I found you. Or maybe I was reading into things. Barbecue waved as he pushed his meaty hand against the glass of the window on the door. The bell clanged and I scrambled to grab the key. Springing to action, I turned the lock and the sign in two neat moves. Uh, kidnapping much? I swiveled to face Alyssa with her hip cocked and a deep grin on her face like it was mine and mine alone. Yeah, yeah, more like stalking much? 
I walked back to the register and flipped off the first light switch. The dome over the front part of the store snuffed to darkness. Okay, I was really joking there, but now I'm concerned. Are you gonna chop me up and grind me down in that little room back there? I blinked my eyes rapidly at the mental picture blooming in my mind of Alyssa and me, the back room, that glorious word, grind. Depends, I struggled to quell the heat spreading from my brain outward. How dried out are you? Got me there, moisturized and supple, baby. Alyssa said as she looked across the floor and passed me, the boards beneath her sandals creaking. She lifted a baggie of tea leaves from its pegs and examined the contents. I mean, technically we did just close. You're not gonna take pity on a poor girl stuck on her feet all afternoon, slaving over sticky ice cream? Was it bad today? I pulled a pack of Lysol wipes from under the counter and yanked out three. Alyssa put back the tea bag and moved along the wall, eyeing up and down. It was fine. Tips were okay, but the hard serve chose violence. She rubbed her upper arm absentmindedly and I winced as I passed the wipes across the surface of the counter, pushing any crumbs and dirt onto the floor to sweep up after I finished. The only reason I became ambidextrous was because of Pono Cones and the fight that went into scooping loose tracks and Brownie Ripple. Well, that and a particularly tall and voracious femme I hooked up with a few weeks about three years ago. Keep a cup of hot water handy, but you'll get used to it. I promise you'll end this summer with wrists of steel. Alyssa sighed. I better get a compliment from you on my handiwork. Well, I mean, you're definitely gonna have to earn it. I'm not just tossing out compliments like they're nothing. Duh, Alyssa laughed. I wouldn't accept it if I didn't have to wrestle it out of you first. She pulled a jar of tea off the shelf and sniffed at its contents. A smile lit up across her face. Mmm, what's this one? That's a chai blend, but it's made from these leaves from South Africa, see? I moved closer, my arm hair barely grazing hers, our skin a bated breath away from touch entirely, and pointed to the small bits of red plant inside the container. They're called rooibos and caffeine free too, so you can have it at night and not worry about staying up. Alyssa nodded, a puff of air exhaling from her nose. What's that? She pointed to the small green pods peppered amongst the leaves and herbs. That is, I walked to the wall with just loose spices. Plucking a glass container off the shelf, I brought it back to her. A cardamom pod. It can come like this or in black seeds or ground. It's in the ginger family. Yeah, like a sister? I laughed, more like a cousin. Want to smell? Alyssa leaned forward as I lifted the wooden lid, broke the airtight seal, and let loose an earthy sniff. Peppery, yet sweet. Mmm, like Christmas. Big chai latte traditions? I would always treat myself to one when I hoofed it out to the mall for present shopping. Was it a long drive? I grew up about 15 minutes from my local mall, 10 from a Target, and within walking distance of my grocery store. The island kept things tight with just enough green in between to call it space without letting people to room to breathe or fart or be. Long bus ride, she clarified, 45 minutes. Oof, I closed the lid on the container and returned it to its indented home on the shelf. People must have loved your gifts, huh? Alyssa carefully placed the bag back onto its peg. Why'd you say that? Well, I just mean, I parsed down the line of jars, tapping down any lids that may be askew. Air was the enemy here. You went so far out of your way. That's like putting double the effort in. I guess I never thought about it like that before. All we really want to know is someone's willing to burn their time for us. We don't get enough of it. Alyssa stared at me, refusing to break her gaze. I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I spun this conversation dark and deep and big. I wanted to look down. I wanted to forgive myself of the intimacy of this moment. My raw and ragged soul dredged up and hung out for her to take to task in my eyes. It hurt my heart to hold on to this brief bit of contact. So minimal, did it even count? And was it hurt I felt, this ache in my chest? Or was it something I knit pain into so long ago that the two eventually became one? No, she said, I don't think we do. All I could do was exhale heavily and watch her take two steps closer to me. She reached out and grabbed my hand. Another small moment. Another tiny gesture, but in my mind, it was huge. Mountainous events erected like craggy peaks against a skyline. She moved one after another, an Amazon, making it look too easy. Her palm was smooth in mine, her fingers long, like her legs. We stood there, linked and still, as the CD and the five-track player clicked off. 
Left alone in the shop with the buzzing of an ancient air conditioner, I inched forward until the toes of my vans tapped the tips of her flip-flops. Focusing on my breathing, I dared myself to look up from the safe space that became the sight of our shoes and locked my stare onto her own. Those brown eyes blinking back at me buzzed with the same electricity I felt knit in our palms, like she stored it in her body and radiated a sun's worth of glow. Can I? It's only me. The question, lost in the blend of cigarettes and chipper that was Walt's voice, seemingly exploded to dust in the air. Alyssa and I jumped back and my elbow caught the counter, smacking with an audible bang. Oh, you're new. All right, thank you. No, thank you. Our next speaker is Claudia Acevedo Quinones. She is a writer from Puerto Rico. Her work focuses on questions of origin, etymology, dreams, and diaspora. Her first book, The Hurricane Book, will be published by Rose Metal Press in 2023. Framed by six hurricanes that have passed through Puerto Rico in the last century, he uses news, clips, poems, songs, historical bullet points, and autobiographical vignettes to look at the ways the colonial relationship between the PR in the U.S. has informed recovery, both economic and personal, on the island and in exile. Her poems and short fiction have appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Wildness, Ambit Magazine, Radar Poetry, and other publications. In 2019, she was a finalist for the Philip Booth Poetry Prize, judged by Mary Rufel. She's also the runner-up for the Split Lip Press's 2020 Hybrid Chapbook Contest. Claudia lives in Brooklyn, New York. Please welcome to the screen, Claudia Acevedo Quinones. I find you here, Claudia, there you are. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't realize that the bit about uh, my book was part of the bio. <laughs> so I guess I don't have to intro the, the excerpt. Oh, but um, you can anyway. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, but you, you, did, you did it, you did a great job. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna read from the San Ciprian section, which um, has mainly deals with my father's side of the family, which is a side I'm not very familiar with. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump around because it could be a little long. Um, okay. So each section um, starts with just basic historical notes to give people context. Um, and it's followed by a little bit of info about that particular hurricane the section is about. And then um, I get into some poems and some autobiographical fragments. Okay, um, historical notes. After the invasion in 1898, Puerto Rico was submitted to US military rule and governed by officials appointed by the states. From an unmailed letter written in 1932 by Cornelius Rhodes, a Rockefeller Institute pathologist conducting research in the San Juan Presbyterian Hospital after his car was vandalized. I can get a damn fine job here and I'm tempted to take it. It would be ideal except for the Puerto Ricans. They are beyond doubt the dirtiest, laziest, most degenerate and thievish race of men ever inhabiting this sphere. It makes you sick to inhabit the same island with them. They are even lower than Italians. What the island needs is not public health work, but a tidal wave or something to totally exterminate the population. It might then be livable. I have done my best to further the process of extermination by killing off eight and transplanting cancer into several more. It was signed Dusty. In 1937, the island enacted law 116, which instituted a population control program designed to catalyze economic growth and respond to depression era unemployment. Strategies used to push poor women into getting hysterectomies or tubal ligations included door-to-door -door visits by healthcare workers, financial incentives, and employer favoritism. These strategies limited informed consent to the point that about a third of the women who underwent the operation did not know that it would leave them permanently sterile. The law was repealed in 1960. In 1976, the US Department of Health, Education and Welfare reported that over 37% of women of childbearing age, on average 26, in Puerto Rico had been sterilized. 
1938, the Democratic Popular, Popular Party, which is still favored by Puerto Ricans in most elections, was founded by Luis Munoz Marin. Their slogan was Bread, Land, Liberty. The party favored the island's independence in its initial stages, but went on to lean toward the middle, con contributing to the status quo. On February 23rd, 1936, nationalists Irán Rosado and Elias Beauchamp killed the island's police chief. This was in response to a police-led massacre at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. Both men were captured and shot to death. On July 23rd of the same year, the Nationalist Party leader, Pedro Luis Campos, along with several of his counterparts, were sentenced to 10 years in a federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia. Campos was jailed again in 1950 and again later that year for collaborating with Oscar Collazo and Griselio Torresola on a failed attack on Harry S. Truman. That time he was sentenced to 80 years in prison. Campos was pardoned by the then governor of the newly coined Free Associated State, Munoz Marin but his pardon was revoked after Lolita Lebron, Rafael Cancel, and Irvin Flores and Andres Figueroa opened fire at the US House of Representatives in DC in 1954, wounding five congressmen. They were sentenced to 50 years imprisonment. So then there's a, a poem, I'm just gonna try to like get through this a little quickly. So we should just, cause Jill and I should just talk. Um, Hurricane San Cipriam. On September 26, 1932, four years after Hurricane San Felipe II, San Ciprian hit Puerto Rico after crossing St. Martin, Anguilla, and the Virgin Islands as a Category 3 hurricane. It took seven hours for the storm, with winds of up to 120 miles an hour at landfall, to cross the island, after which it headed on westward until it dissipated on October 3rd. Its east to west path, a trajectory that wouldn't repeat itself until Hurricane George in 1998 guaranteed destruction across all 78 municipalities. Around 225 people died as well as 400,000 livestock. It killed 100 people in the town of Piedras and more than 70,000 people were left homeless. 24 of those died when a shelter in Arecibo collapsed. The entire citrus harvest and 42,000 buildings were destroyed. The total cost of the damage was around $30 million, almost half a billion dollars by today's standards. In a time when the island was still recovering from losses, losses suffer, suffered during San Felipe II in 1928, which is very similar to what's happening now, really. Um, okay, so now we get into the gossip part of it. Um, uh, this section is titled Neil Armstrong. A father is a legend. He can be told in a number of ways. He is there to explain something that happened. The fathers in the story are Odysseus, icons for leaving and coming. My father's father lost his father to suicide. My father's father was a gallivanting joker. I wonder if my father has grown to believe his stories. What I know of my father's parents came to me in his tall tales, bits and pieces from overheard conversations and my uncle's poems. What I thought I knew was this. My great-grandfather owned one of the first movie theaters in the town of Corozal. Right around the depression, his earnings plummeted and he shot himself. His son, my grandfather, married my grandmother when, she was, when he was 32 and she was 14 or 15. An orphan, she stopped going to school after the fifth grade to make money for herself and her wheelchair-bound brother. Her father had been a cobbler. The mother wasn't around. When she met my grandfather, she may have been working as a shop girl and living in her aunt's hostel in San Dulce. She had six children, four boys and two girls by the time she was in her mid twenties. My father was the second or third oldest son. I never saw her smile except for when she danced or sang. She called my grandfather by his surname and drew girlish flowers on napkins. According to a study conducted by the Council on Higher Education in 1958, between 79 and 85% of the population was illiterate at the end of Spanish rule on the island. At that time, 268,000 of the 810,000 inhabitants were children, but only 16% of the latter were in school. Around the time my grandmother left school, net school enrollment for teenagers was between 25% and 30%. My father said she rarely left the house when he and his siblings were growing up that her closest friends were nuns who sent her messages, clipped clotheslines, and stopped by to watch TV. When Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, the nuns were there sitting among the children. My uncle, the poet, writes, Hazme café amorosamente para no decirnos te quiero. Make me coffee lovingly so we don't have to say I love you. 
This is the last section I'll read. My paternal great-grandfather Agustin and I almost shared a birthday. We may have if I hadn't wrapped the umbilical cord around my neck three times or tried to leave my mother's birth canal last first when she went into labor, which delayed things by a couple of days. I still can't sleep unless I'm twisting myself into uncomfortable positions. People born on that week in January are, according to my old copy of The Secret Language of Birthdays, chaotic, difficult, eruptive, exciting, entertaining, and lighthearted on any given day. Under the advice section for those born on January 17th, it reads, relinquishing control can free you in all caps. He was born on January 17th, 1895 to Juan and Belen in Carolina, a municipality now also referred to as the Tierra de Gigantes due to it being the birthplace of the tallest Puerto Rican on record, Felipe Virriel and the late poet, Julia de Burgos. Two months after Agustin was born, the Lumiere brothers uh, released what is incorrectly considered to be the first movie ever made, Workers Leaving the Lumiere Factory. When my father told me Agustin had owned the first movie theater in his town, I didn't question it. Juan Agustin's father died of tuberculos tuberculosis on New Year's Eve, 1897. The Spanish-American War wouldn't happen for another 16 months, so Puerto Rico is still a province of Spain. Agustin was two years old and the youngest of three sons when his father died. He was three years old when the US flag replaced the Spanish one on every school, hospital, and government building. According to a 1917 World War I registration card I found on the internet, Agustin, a government clerk at 22, claimed to be exempt from military service because he was providing for his widowed mother. His weight and height are registered as regular. His eyes and hair were brown. He was white. That same year in December, he married my great grandmother, Edelmira in Corozal, a mountainous town in the Cordillera Central that is prone to mudslides and floods due to the many rivers running through and around it. The name Corozal comes from Corozo, which is a type of palm tree that thrives there. Edelmira's name means princess. She was the eldest of five sisters, all born two years apart. Edelmira, Rosario, Mercedes, Rosaura, Ramona. My grandfather, Jose Agustin, was born a year after Agustin and Edelmira got married. Seven months after Belen, Agustin's widowed mother died. Then five other kids were born. Then around 4 p.m. on his 33rd birthday, Agustin died. Nowhere on the death certificate I also found on the internet does it say he owned anything, much less a movie theater. His occupation is listed as being empleado, employee. There is no company, no store. If he did own a theater, I couldn't find a record confirming it. Things that are without question true are that on January 17th, 1927, Bertha Kitt was born in South Carolina and the Scarlet Letter with Lillian Gish was showing in theaters. It was a Monday and it was the day my great-grandfather Agustin shot a bullet into his brain. His wife was five months pregnant. She went on to outlive at least two of her children and died two years before I was born. I have one picture of her. She has the eyes of someone hollowing out a downturned mouth, an avian nose. She poses with a bunch of dark roses in her hands and keeps them away from her chest as if she's saying, is this what you want? Thank you. Excellent. Yay. Hello. So Hi. now we talk? Now we yeah, talk. Now we talk. That's great. So Claudia and I know each other. We go way back. We went to school together. Um, I want to say you were the first person whose work I read and I was shocked. Really? I was like, I should not be in class with this person. I don't know what I'm doing. I think I may have gotten a little bit of pee on myself in the bathroom. I don't think, um, I don't know. <laughs> but also to connect this back to the wonderful individual that started this group, Roger was one of the loud advocates in your corner that always, always encouraged me to look to your work. Geez, Roger, that's really putting me on the spot. <laughs> he loves big. He definitely loves big. Well, that's that's really lovely. I wish I had had more classes with you. Um, I feel like we were we were at, at, at grad school around the same time, but I think that I was maybe like a year. I graduated like a year earlier. Mm -hmm. than you did. Yeah. Um, and I feel like my 
best writing has already been, <laughs> it's already behind me. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit before we, um, we went live, but um, we were talking about, you know, the struggle of trying to, to write when we're also trying to survive, work a full-time job, live our lives, have dinner. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in knowing like how you balance all of that and how you feel you are right now with your yeah. writing. Um, so, I mean, first I, I want to disagree with you with saying that your best work has already come, but at the same time, I want to express that when I felt the most creative and the most generative was when I was finishing up my thesis and I had set this massive schedule for myself and I was reading other people's work and I was writing and I was becoming unbearable to normal people and it felt just so incredible. And I've certainly drifted away from that a bit, but I also just was in a big transition where I switched careers and I moved and so I went from a job where I was sitting 12 hours in front of a computer screen, not working very hard so I could have my writing up. Mm -hmm. And now I'm working a nine to five that has me really dedicated and working with college students. So my writing life for the past few months has kind of been non-existent, but at the same time, I was working on a chapter that wasn't working. And I think that's the fastest way to get distance from the process is when you keep hitting your head against a brick wall and wondering why it won't yield. So I definitely have to get back into it. But when I have time, I want to lay in bed. That's exactly my issue. So um, I started I started a new job uh, at a, a Grey Wolf Press this this month, last, it's been a year now. Um, I'm working there as a publicist. So I'm constantly rooting for other people, reading other people, writing other people. Um, I also have like two other roles within the organization. So a lot of my energy goes towards that. And when I have time off, I want to stare at the ceiling. And, um, and it has been the case for longer than I've been employed at this place, um, which I love, by the way. Um, but it's 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 been really rough, and you add the pandemic to that, um, and an overall feeling that you know, like my development as a writer and as a human has sort of stopped. Um, uh, and then I'm I'm being faced with like edits for this manuscript that is due to come out next year, and I hadn't written a word for months months like I, ha I have this dream journal and I write in it every I try, try to write in it every morning but I wasn't even doing that um mm -hmm. so I was like flung into this process again and I am so tired I'm so tired of this book like I hate it I don't want to look at it anymore the words have stopped having meaning um and while I want to start something new, I'm so exhausted sometimes that that I really can't I can't bring myself to 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 do it. Um, yeah, I I feel like I'm lucky because I'm in a university setting, and I'm specializing in the arts, creativity, and media students. So I do get to very much glob onto their dreams and <laughs> forget my name tag. So I look like a student, and that's been fun, but recently Spy. yeah it's it's great to trick them they don't know um but i i one of the faculty there is cj hauser and she has this great group that's like really informal but you just sit on the third floor of one of the buildings and write and it doesn't matter who you are just come so i am planning on infiltrating that but then to prepare for it i was like well let me read something of hers and i read one of her short stories when i was supposed to be doing work and I needed to do a lap around the building because I was like, this is, I need to read more, gets me writing more, gets me focused away from the TV that I want to mush my brain with. Because I just, it's, I think as writers, we form tight connections, but then break them immediately. 
And because I mean, I, at least for myself, I feel like I exist so much in my head. I can get lost a lot in there too. Yeah. I get lost in there all the time. And, and the, the, it doesn't help that I'm, that I work from home too. And I'm currently in a basement. So it's, it's a, I feel like I'm a cave, a cave woman, um, mm-hmm. just waiting for someone to come with the meat. I keep thinking about banana meat. I love it when people refer to uh, fruit as meat. As meat. Yeah. It makes total sense. And it's, it's just incredible. I was also struck by the fact that we're both writing about islands. Yeah. But yours is very much like a place of home that you attack at different angles. And mine is also a place of home, but I do intend on skewering it through. Those, those are, that's like the most important theme, I think, yeah. like home and that like concept, like that, that idea that one has that sometimes work is home. Mm-hmm. Um, that is like, I, that really resonates with me. I feel like home and work become home. I mean, sorry, uh, work, work and writing become home. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not a full, I mean, it's not I'm a curious. complete thought. So uh, is there anything that you are able to delve into that's a creative outlet while you're experiencing your drought? Um, I'm trying to think. No, I feel like being in, con- being in close contact with friends, um, friends who I know are actively writing um, is the best way to spark something. Um, and also just forcing myself to sit down and do it. Um, yeah. I had to sit down and work on the edits for the book. I had to expand it significantly because it was pretty short and it needed a lot more detail and mm-hmm. development. But um, it was super difficult. And after I did that for a few months, I just stopped. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. It's like I, I, I'm completely emotionally spent um but I do think that if I exercised more that if I walked more and if I hung out with my friends more all things that I should be doing but I don't because I'm staring at a computer all day um those would definitely help Um, now is this going to be your first book yeah so I I always want to mention this because this was another person in our grad program that was really influential for me Marissa Levine. Right. Big advice for me was that the book that you graduate with, that you write, is not going to be the book that you publish. And to you, I say, I'm not surprised that this is the book you publish because you had such a, a sense of surety about it when we were in our program together. And I always really admired that about you. Was that the original plan when you started the MFA program? Um, I don't think it was. I think that I wanted to, I had an idea of what I wanted, what I wanted the project to, to be. And then when Hurricane Maria hit, it sort of like kind of brought it all together mm-hmm. for me. Um, and I don't know. I feel like a lot of the the book is like me trying to bring to light a lot of stuff that um, has been like kept quiet, um, both like just like in the public realm and also personally. Um, So the act of publishing it, like regardless of who it is, I'm glad it's a small press, um, is sort of like an act of like not defiance, maybe it is, but yeah. um, it just felt like something that I had to do so that I could move on and work on something else. Yep. Um, I wanna get this out of my system and I hate it now. So I wanna get it out even more. Yeah, even more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I said I wouldn't ask about it and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so the, the book you read from now, was that what you were working on in grad school or is this a new project? Oh. Um, so I finished the program with a memoir Mm -hmm. 
and I wrote it and I was really happy about it, but it was the same thing that you were sort of feeling. I, I did it and I was sick about writing about myself and mm -hmm. I never wanted to write about myself again, which was odd because I didn't start the program writing nonfiction. Mm -hmm. But I feel like my process is that the things that you write have a genre that fits them. And I like to lead with that because I don't like to really tie myself to genre a lot. So I'll cross over a whole bunch of different ones. But this one, I had some of the plot points in my head and randomly over the summer, um, a really small journal published one of my stories that has like a major plot point that's gonna be in this book. And I was like, oh, I guess that's a sign. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I've been tussling with it. There's definitely been parts of it. Like I've always wanted to write a story about Long Island because I grew up there and I think there's so many weird parts of it and I've gotten to know some of the weird parts well, so I would like to shine the light on them. But yeah, I, I never thought fiction. I never took a fiction class. I thought fiction, fiction was not for me. And then an idea just came and, and fit the shape of it well. Mm -hmm. So I started working on it and parts of it came really quickly. And then other parts of it feel like they're being slowly pulled out of my midsection. Mm -hmm. So I my, my method is I go into each chapter knowing that there's a problem I have to solve by the end mm -hmm. and it feels productive, but the chapter I'm stuck on, there's no problem. So that's where I'm stuck. How can we create a problem? I don't know. I, I'm thinking I have to go a little dreamlike and that's usually where I end up is mm -hmm. let me just do something weird and stupid. And I was writing a chapter for another section and the, it ends with the character like laying on her bed and falls asleep. And instead of trying to wrap it up nicely, she has a dream about a frog eating her from her toes up. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm cool with that. Well, yeah, that's what life is anyway. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes like, frogs munch on you. Most of the time there is no solution and there's just a frog trying to eat you. Yeah. And I'm also trying to get away from, I feel like a lot when I'm stuck and I'm writing, I go back and I keep trying to make things better and better. And it's just a way for me to spin my wheels. So I really am trying to get into, okay, it doesn't matter if you said in this chapter something and then you repeated it in another one. It's not the time to look at that. Mm -hmm. It's the time to just go. Yeah. An editor will catch that. Also, your reader yeah. doesn't mind being reminded, I don't think. I like being reminded of things. I have a bad memory and, and that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I, my process is very much like, Oh, you didn't hear that before. I'm going to tell you it again. Yeah. Stop. I, I, it's, it's really, it's good to hear you say that you look at each chapter as a problem that needs to be solved. I guess I don't look at it as a problem to be solved in my case, but I want to have like a general feel for each section. Mm -hmm. And then I work a lot with association to get me through. Um, so yeah, I don't really think in plot. I think more like, oh, if this is this, then that is that. But mm -hmm. also I learned that this fits into this. Let me like collage these things together. Uh, and I love and the idea of that. It's the only way I can do it, I think. Or maybe I just need to try harder to do it a different way. But no, it's the way that makes sense the most to me, especially with nonfiction. Yeah, and I think what association does really effectively is that it it makes almost like the crafting of an essay seem accessible because if you're associating things, then you're allowing things to surprise not only you, but the reader. Mm -hmm. And then the conclusions that get drawn once everything is woven together become really beautiful. The element of surprise is the the one of the main things that keeps me going back to writing because I think writing sucks um, and it's incredibly difficult. Uh, I, I don't think it's harder than teaching, <laughs> but it's pretty hard. Um, and and I do think that that element of surprise, like finding finding yourself like. There's a really good line in what you just read 
there you are. I found you, you know, it's like that. It's that feeling. It's like either like the most, it's the scariest thing in the world to hear. And also like the, the nicest one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like when I'm reading something really, really great, I identify with or something that's really teaching me something that I needed to know at that particular time. It's like, I found you. And like, it happens sometimes when I'm writing just the process of it. Yeah. I've been trying to force myself. I don't read a lot of fiction, which proved to be a struggle now that I was writing fiction. So I tried to pick up a lot of queer fiction because I wanted to see if there was already a place on the shelf for what I was trying to do. And I always love the Alexander Chi idea of like, imagine yourself on the shelf, put, put mm -hmm. a little marker there. That's where you belong. And so I wasn't finding it. And it was kind of the opposite. I was like, ah, I found myself there. Yeah. I <laughs> and then just keep like forcing in that direction. Yeah. I, I don't think of myself or my, my writing that way. And I feel like it would be very beneficial to me if I did, if I considered like the rest of, of, of that world or genre. Um, yeah, that's really smart. Well, I mean, also I'm, ju I'm just such a visual person. I have these little, like, I, don't, I, I tend to fall into crafting holes when I'm not writing because it's a way for me to still express myself. And so I, made these little books and mm. because I made them they're by me so they're alphabetically on my bookshelf and so I really now can I we do see them. some oh wait you're not at home okay. no I am at home. oh you are okay great I'm gonna carry you with me though so no one can see my sweatpants perfect <laughs> okay mm, this one that's actually, for the after party yeah this one has an uh, abandoned picture on the front too oh that's nice yarn makes the side the pages on Fold. It's a great time. Super fun. Highly recommend making your own books. I've only made a couple of them. I actually made some in, in grad school because it was part of our like final assignment for a poetry class. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It's it's just like the little methodical things that I like, but also to know that I've spent maybe like two hours and there's something that I've made from that. Yeah, and it's a neat little container. Like, you know mm -hmm. that there's a complete thing in there. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes I bring it around with me places to write. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes it's journal. Sometimes it's me outlining stuff. But I've also had to get to a place where, and I figured this out through looking for my memoir, but when I journal, I tend to judge myself as I'm writing. Oh, yeah, same. And so now I'm much more in a place where like, if I want to just scribble really hard and big words across the whole page, I do that. And if I want to rip the page out as I'm writing, I do that and try not to filter because, you know, if I ever come back and write another memoir, I don't want to have that same mindset of, you don't know what you're talking about right now. You don't know how you feel. Yeah. That's, I mean, now that you're like you're talking about this, that this reminds me of, do you know Lucy, Lucy Ives, the novelist? No. She puts out a, a new um, writing prompt every Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, she posts it to her Instagram and okay. they're all really wacky, really out there. Um, I think the other day the prompt was uh, write a how-to guide or like eating like potting soil or something like that. Like write a how-to guide for something really ridiculous. Um, little things like that. And someone put it together, put all the prompts together into like a little chapbook type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, um, I'm just thinking out loud, but doing something with your hands, crafting and working on little prompts is, mm -hmm. is like a really great way of like, to dig yourself out of of any like writing hole yeah so yeah that that's the other thing I was going to say that when I can't write I just tend to go to a prompt um when I'm less depressed I tend to do that I've never been a big prompt person so when I'm stuck I tend to go micro mm -hmm. but I think that would be like the the gut of answering any prompt anyway is to try and answer it as tightly as you can and then yeah. let yourself loose. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it takes like, it, I feel like a prompt gives me permission mm -hmm. um, because I'm so wound up all the time that I, I just need to loosen up. So if someone gives me some sort of guideline, it's like, here, take this time to do this particular thing. Mm -hmm. Then I can allow myself to actually spend the time and do it. Um, but then we get into things about self-worth and all that shit. That it's dark and it's deep. We don't have to talk no, but about. prompt us permission. I, I yeah. love that. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> I'm glad that worked you out. Know that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what are, what are you reading these days? <laughs> that was a good segue. Okay, segue. <laughs> Um, so ironically, it's a tea. That's the name of a tea, but it's uh, Yerba Mate by Nina LaCour, I think the last oh, name. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard, I've heard of it. I've been meaning to check it out, but I haven't. It's pretty good. I got to this point where I was recognizing that um, book covers these days, at least for fiction, are all doing the same, like, sort of stylistic move. Let me check the... Where it's like... Um, it's, it's something about like bright color blocking, big yeah. meaning text. Mm -hmm. And so I liked that this, I knew I wanted to read this book anyway, but I liked that the cover of it had actual concrete images to cut across that stylistic move. And then kind of, so I'm not in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York, but I do drive through it on the way to work. So the town that's brought up vaguely in the beginning of the story felt very close to what I was driving past mm -hmm. and then I was also reading it on campus no one knew who I was surrounded by college students that were like either trying to get to know one another or already knew one another and it was just one of those like right place right time yeah I love it when that happens yeah you can think about books in terms of seasons mm -hmm. yeah. what are you reading now I'm reading for work, <laughs> um, but it's a great book, so I'm pretty lucky. Um, it's it's titled Voyager. It's the first memoir by um, Nona Fernandez. She's she's a Chilean actor and writer. Um, it's 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 a memoir about her mother. Her mother started having um, epileptic seizures um shortly before she started writing this book um and then she went to the to her mother's neurologist with her and they showed like these sort of brain maps Ooh. um anyway she was fascinated by this so she started like looking into the like relationship between like the brain and the cosmos and uh she gets into physics and space and memory and time travel so um yeah it's it's a memoir about space and and mothers <laughs> yeah it's really good it's very strange very very strange but that's so writer to see mm -hmm. a brain map and just fall down a rabbit hole yeah to just see stars yeah great discussion ladies i really enjoyed sort of feeling like a voyeur <laughs> talking about <laughs> um one of the questions that i have for you is when you write what comes first the the idea of the plot or characters in the case of fiction or, or is it place is it people um what's your process in building a story i mean i come from a background that's mixed a bit with screenwriting so i hear the words of all my professors echo that it's about character that we watch movies for character that we follow movies for character but i don't know i think then being someone who like i mentioned before kind of works around genre i think it's the story that comes first to me because i want to make sure that i like the world in which my characters exist I'm sort of the the opposite. I, I definitely start with character um, most of the time. I also don't write a lot of fiction. Um, mm. 
and the nonfiction I write, even though it's obviously like deeply, it's, I mean, it, it, it's about a place, but I'm more interested in people than places. And like when I watch a movie, I'd rather watch, I ra I'd rather follow someone for four hours than have like a major like plot heavy action film. Um, so yeah, I guess that's anyway. <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah. Now, um, do you have a book that you read that you wish you had written? It's an odd question, but. Hmm. It's not homework either, so you don't have to. <laughs> well, it's one of my faves and I've actually taught it before and I read it during my grad program and I've reread it so many times that the binding is now broken, but I also love the author, Rebecca Mackay, but the hundred oh. year knocked my socks off not i don't even know knock my socks off um the detail work there is insane i get a new kick out of it every time i have a new dream to open an artist colony it if i could write a book that does that for someone else i consider my career a success yeah, yeah. she's got a new book coming out soon i can't wait i have it pre-ordered <laughs> <laughs> good for you pre-orders well, are great for bookstores good absolutely it's the only way to get through the holiday season too. Fair warning. Really? Yeah, yeah because everything, well, that's a whole other discussion. Publishing <laughs> has changed quite a bit, you know, publishing. If pre-orders are the way to make sure that you get what you need right uh -huh. now, it's, it's a little bit more of a crisis than they're letting on. It also affects events. Right? It very much affects events and it affects publishing books. The fact that you're in the queue for your book I think is absolutely wonderful because that that that's so hopeful you you have no I, I mean you should feel so gloriously happy about that because it's the the publishing world has changed quite a bit and we're all just kind of staying sunny and working our way through it yeah but is there anyone that you feel that that you're just driven to, or you have a book that you, Claudia, that you um, wish you had written, or is that a thing for you? Um, it happens a lot, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I guess the one that came to mind when you asked, uh, it's not super original to say this, but Bluets by Maggie Nelson, I feel like, oh, I wish I'd come up with this. It's so, concise and so beautiful and so innovative um and I just find it to be the most perfect treatment like of, of the fallout of a relationship um that and Lydia Davis's um the name? what's the title of that book by Lydia Davis the end of the story um Anyway, those are two books about breakups that deal with it in very different ways, but they're both very, very innovative and and just gorgeous. Um, I don't. And Randall and likes things. Lydia Davis in the chat. She's yeah, Lydia. Lydia Davis. So right. it's I love it when people have sort of fallen into someone that they really, really it touches them, mm -hmm. and they have to read everything that that person has ever written, and then you just go for a different discovery after that. Yeah. Um, yeah, Bluettes is currently in my briefcase. It's my reread book to get myself inspired again. It's great and so portable. Mm -hmm. Well, you both have raised such interesting questions about what keeps you focused, what what inspires you to move forward. And I don't want, you know, I felt that there was a little bit of a discouragement there, with particularly with you, Claudia. And so keep your chin <laughs> up. And, no, no. I just want to tell you, it's a lot more. I mean, I'm really looking forward to your book. What you read was Thank just you. spectacular. And Jillian, you're just going to have to let me know when you're headed to print. You know, I'll, I'll really make will. it through. Don't you, you will. <laughs> you will, but you know where to call because I carry <laughs> those things here. So. <laughs> but ladies, our evening has wound up and I really just want to thank you for this discussion and thank you for all the points that you raised. What a great episode. So 
I'm going to remove your spotlight and wind it up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I'd like to thank Jillian and Claudia for participating in Write America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write, of Write America. We hope to see you all next Monday, October 17th, as we welcome Edward Zwick, Paul Harding, and Hilma Wolitzer. Please remember to check out Bird's Books Write America page where you can find out information about our upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you, folks. Have a great evening. <laughs>